all, it's Reya and welcome to another video. Today I'm going to be sharing with you the very last reading wrap-up uh, for the year of 2022, just as we are in uh, January of 2023. Gotta brush out the previous year before we can start out, start out with the new one. So without further ado, let's get started. So in December, I actually read uh, quite little. Uh, I started a, a bunch of books, but I actually am still reading some of them. So uh, those will be in my January wrap up, hopefully. So uh, in effect, I actually completed one magazine, one novella, one manga volume, and uh, I DNF'd one uh, nonfiction book. So. I'm going to be starting with the non-fiction book that I DNF'd, get the, get the bad taste out of my mouth, you know? And uh, that is Why Does He Do That uh, Inside the Minds of Angry and Controlling Men by Lundy Bancroft. Now, this book was recommended to me by my friend uh, because of all of the uh, things that I was going through in my personal life, and I thought that I would um, read it. And... First of all, caveats. This book is 20 years old. It was published in like the mid 2000s, so it, it's like 20 years old. So a lot of this information would be out of date anyway. And I went in knowing this. I, I was already like sort of um, adjusting my expectations based on that. Um, but um, as I was reading this, there were some interesting points made about especially uh, the portions about um, manipulativeness and uh, the sort of like uh, different sort of strategies that a person might might use when they are manipulating you and how to recognize those. Those were pretty uh, interesting and I, I could relate to a lot of those. I also um, was able to identify some toxic uh, behaviors in myself um, that I might have been leaning into. Uh, and those were very, very valuable. However, I DNF this book at around 110, 115 pages or so. And the reason is, this book very clearly categorizes abusers as men and people who are abused as women. It acknowledges this uh, in the like opening sort of terminology, uh, the author does say that he will use um, like um, like men as the term term for most abusers and for most um, like abused people, uh, he will use the term women because that's basically how it often boils down to. He makes a a point about having a chapter where he sort of goes over. Um, queer relationships. However, um, this book doesn't even acknowledge the existence of transgender and non-binary individuals. So there's that. Another thing um, was that this book is all about anecdotal evidence. So the author is, uh, from what I understand, a psychiatrist or a psychologist, and uh, he basically uses his experience uh, in the field and uh, the sort of patients that he's treated as case studies, which is fine and dandy. However, at no point does he uh, reference any peer-reviewed studies. There is no source list anywhere. So even if he has like thousands of patients, you know, uh, if there if there's no references to any peer-reviewed studies, that's just like, you know, you are saying this stuff. Um, and there's like you are providing no evidence to back any of your assertions up, and that frustrated me to no end. So uh, yeah, those were the major two reasons why I eventually DNF this book because it was very uncomfortable to read uh, because of that, and also as a queer, <laughs> a queer gender nonconforming individual, uh, the constant lumping together of all abusers as men and all abused people as women was very, um, let's just say uncomfortable because like it completely ignores the fact how gender 
in fact can be a reason for someone to abuse you and can provide different tactics of abuse for someone. So uh, that is the reason why I DNF this. Uh, I'm sure for some people this book might provide uh, more insights and be be a thought-provoking read, but for me it just was too uncomfortable. And uh, aside from the few mm, nuggets of insight that I uh, that I got in the beginning, uh, in the end it wasn't worth it for me to continue because I was just getting more frustrated as I went on. So yeah, DNF'd. And then, uh, moving on to the things that I actually finished, I finished uh, the uh, issue 15 of Anathema magazine uh, for the Shorts and Sorcery Book Club. This is a speculative fiction magazine that specializes and sort of centers marginalized and like diverse voices and tries to incorporate a lot of different storytellers and new authors, new to the scene authors, um, uh, in their in their like lineup. And I thought that this was such a fantastic magazine. I will be reading more from this magazine. Like I think that if I have to pick like three magazines from uh, last year that we read as a book club for the Shorts and Sorcery book club, Anathema magazine, Corio, and uh, the Future Science Fiction Digest were my three favorites. Obviously we also read for Fire magazine and Uncanny, but they are more established and I think that these three are, are some of the lesser known ones. So yeah, I read the issue 15 of Anathema magazine and I have a whole live show talking about my experience with that reading, so I will link that up up, up above in the comments. And then I read volume 6 of Sweat and Soap by Kintetsu Yamada, uh, translated by Matt Trevord. And uh, this was okay. I have been really liking Sweat and Soap, but I have to say that this particular volume has been... Um, my least favorite so far. I think I gave this three and a half or three stars. It was still fine, but there was this instance of sort of <laughs> jealousy that was that went unaddressed, and I personally felt that it was really stupid. Like the 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 reason why Natori gets jealous is that Asako accepts another man's business card and doesn't reject him. And I'm like, okay, sure, sure. But at the same time, I'm like, that that is the most stupid reason to get jealous out of anything, especially considering the whole business card culture in, in, in most of Asia. <laughs> like, you just exchange business cards with everyone. I have exchanged business cards. Should someone get jealous over me because of that? Should should someone get jealous over their spouse because they received a business card from me? What the hell? Like, that was so stupid. And the way it was dealt with was so, like, stupid because it put Asako in a defensive position. And eventually she was like, oh, yeah, I, I completely understand why that made you uncomfortable. No! No! <laughs> There was no reason for Natori to be uncomfortable. This, that is so stupid. That is so, so stupid. And sort of plays into this idea of men having ownership over their, like, spouses. Like, no, don't lean into that, please. So, yeah, that was, like, something that I really did not enjoy about this volume. Other than that, it was very cute. Uh, this whole thing is about them basically moving in together, finally. And, and starting out their, like, domestic life together, essentially. So all in all, it, it's, it was very cute. Aside from that one thing, I was like, that is so stupid. So damn stupid. That's like a red flag. That's like a red flag. If someone starts to be, like, pissy with you because you accepted someone else's business card, dump them. <laughs> Seriously, that's a red flag. But yeah, uh, so uh, around three stars, I think, was my uh, overall rating for this. Um, but I, I, I still keep enjoying this series. And then finally, I read Into the Riverlands by Nivo. This is the third installment in the Singing Hills cycle of novellas. 
uh, which started with uh, the Empress of Salt and Fortune, which is one of my favorite things ever. Uh, and I keep singing this, um, <laughs> singing, singing hills, anyway. I, I, I keep uh, shouting the praises for this series. Um, so in this installment, the cleric Chi and uh, all, and uh, their companion, all, all almost brilliant, uh, go into the Riverlands, which is this sort of very dangerous and sort of rough area um, of this world uh, that, that uh, they are inhabiting. And uh, it is also a place that is very famous for all of these martial arts figures and all of these sort of legendary warriors and uh, bandits and all, all sorts of like people um, who, who are um, like famous in this region. And uh, the uh, cleric chi is visiting this region, and they uh, they they meet up with uh, these two women who are traveling in the region, as well as this older couple, and uh, they are sharing stories while they are traveling together, and also running across this sort of like group of legendary bandits who, uh, for all intents and purposes, should have been wiped out ages ago. But are they really? This is all about sharing stories and storytelling and how different people have different versions of the same story as well as different people having different takeaways and different interpretations and different focus points on the same story. And how one person can have multiple different stories told of their life all of which can be equally true and equally false at the same time. Because no one ever has the full picture of one person. And I just love this type of theming. I like I love all of the themes in the Singing Hill, Hill cycle. Like basically the idea of storytelling and, and who gets to control the narrative is a running theme throughout the whole series, and I am a sucker for that theme. I am a sucker for those tropes. I love it. Like, it's candy to me. Give me more. I, I love it. Uh, that said, I felt that this was not the strongest um, entry in the series. I still maintain that um, I have loved The Empress of Salt and Fortune the most, uh, but I think in this case, if you are someone who likes very, like, action-packed, like, for example, if you like wuxia movies, like, very action-packed, like, martial arts feats and stuff, you will be very much at home with this. Uh, that was one of my favorites part in, part, parts in this uh, novella. Uh, this, this is very action-packed. That is probably why it feels a little different from the other volumes, which are more, like, introspective, more intimate and... Uh, and are not very heavy with the action. So in in that sense, it isn't worse than the other ones. It is just different. I gave this four stars and I would definitely recommend it. And there you have it. Those were all of the things that I read in the month of December, the very final things that I read in 2022, uh, all wrapped up. Now we can move on to the next year. And the next video that you should be seeing is my goals and intentions video. And uh, if you got this far, please leave me a pig. A pig emoji or a boar. Is there a boar emoji? Maybe there is. Pig or a boar in honor of uh, Into the Riverlands, which I very much enjoyed. And uh, yeah, I will see you in another video very soon. Bye bye!